I am uh, Robert Kaufman, the uh, visiting conservative professor in the Center for Western Thought. I have the great privilege tonight to introduce you to our speaker, uh, Professor Henry Now, George Washington's Elliott School, also former associate dean there. Um, Henry has a vast array of accomplishments. Uh, he received his BA from, uh, actually BS, from MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and his PhD from Johns Hopkins School of International Studies. Uh, Henry is widely published uh, at the highest level. He's written multiple books, uh, two of which are beyond very good, which is a uh, quality of all of his publications, simply outstanding. Let me start with one of his earliest, uh, The Myth of American Decline in 1990, which got right when everybody else was getting it wrong that the United States was still going to be the world's dominant power economically, militarily, and politically. And for those of you old enough to remember back to 1990, the rage then was that Japan was number one. That was the, uh, the conventional wisdom. And as usual, Henry defied it. And as usual, Henry got it right. Um, and his most recent book, uh, Conservative Internationalism, is also uh, simply outstanding. Uh, Henry, in his work, brings almost an Aristotelian sensibility to it, uh, married to Adam Smith. Uh, he is well trained in a variety of disciplines, and what's striking about his work is not only their intellectual depth, but the common sense that suffuses it. Uh, let me give you an example in conservative internationalism. Henry resists the propensity of political scientists to try to make international relations into a natural science. He doesn't, to quote Aristotle, go beyond the level of what the subject matter exists. And he lays out very compellingly in the spirit of Robert Endicott Osgood a, a hybrid paradigm of conservative internationalism that takes seriously ideals, self-interest, international distribution of power, regime type, and the nature of political leadership. In addition to his scholarly uh, exploits, Henry also served with distinction between 1981 and 1983 uh, on Ronald Reagan's National Security Council at a pivotal period when the Reagan administration was laying out the architecture and the grand strategy for winning the Cold War. So you're in for a treat tonight because Henry is going to bring his same common sense, erudition, and high level of academic rigor to dispelling the hysteria about Donald Trump's foreign policy and putting it soberly um, in historic and comparative perspective. Please welcome Henry Now. Now we got it. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Shall I start over? <laughs> okay. When we uh, you know, leave Washington, we always like to say, oh gosh, isn't it good to get back out into real America? Maybe that's even gotten worse in the 40 years that I've been in Washington. But I am very, very pleased to be here. And especially, by the way, as part of a program that's got conservative in its title. Um, I have been in the profession for 45 years and um, um, always, by the way, learned about liberal internationalism, uh, realism, nationalism, other traditions, but nobody ever talked about conservative internationalism. And so I, I always light up when a program has the word conservative 
in it, and uh, I am particularly grateful to my colleague, uh, Robert, uh, for inviting me, and uh, by the way, for the terrific uh, books uh, that he has written, and most importantly, his last book on uh, uh, the Obama administration, Dangerous uh, Doctrine, uh, I recommend that book to you. I reviewed it, and it's extremely uh, helpful in understanding, and I think very fairly. He's critical of Obama, but he's very um, um, empirical about addressing the aspects of Obama's policies and showing where they might uh, have fallen short. Well, uh, the question I want to raise this evening is the following. What's, what's the right mix of nationalism, sort of more self-restraint, more pulling back in terms of America's expectations in the world, uh, and globalism, all right, being actively engaged in trying to lead uh, the global community? What's the right mix in American foreign policy today? Now, I hope I'm not going to ruin anybody's evening, uh, because I'm going to say something constructive about Donald Trump, um, very politically incorrect uh, at, at, at the present time. But my argument will be that Trump's foreign policy may actually offer us um, a, an a, a way of finding the right mix of nationalism and globalism for the, face, for the situation that we face today. Now, I'm going to make my comments in the con uh, my argument, place my argument in the context of three points. First of all, I want to argue that nationalism is not a dirty word. Uh, it's in fact the only true foundation of diversity and freedom in the world. Just as freedom at home starts with free individuals and government, or uh, free individuals, not government, so freedom abroad starts with free, free nations, not international institutions. Second, I'm going to argue that American nationalism is different. It's not traditional nationalism. Traditional nationalism was premised on monarchy, a state church, mercantilism, the idea that it was better to export than to import, and ethnocentricity, some kind of a unified race or culture. American nationalism was built on self-government, in opposition to monarchy, freedom of religion, in opposition to a state church, open markets with all countries that encouraged imports, not just exports, in opposition to sort of colonial trading arrangements. And although beginning as a British society, except for slaves, we were 90% British, 10% slaves, open immigration and ethnic diversity, not ethnic or cultural homogeneity. Now this type of American nationalism, I will argue, forged the globalism that we have today in the world a world of greater wealth and equality among nations than ever before, a democratic peace that embraces all the major industrialized countries, globalized and prosperous world markets, which any country can get rich, former enemies like Germany and Japan, but also prospective enemies like China, and a world broadly concerned with human rights and democratic government. My third point, however, is that this kind, in this kind of world spawned by a unique American nationalism, Globalism may need to be recalibrated. Globalism was never intended to become a centralized world government. That is an empire, a one-size-fits-all international community that replaces nationalism. This, unfortunately, is the elitist or liberal view of globalism. Centralized international institutions gradually take over more and more responsibilities from nation states. Even national security is eventually replaced by collective security. Nations go to war only with multilateral consent. Now, this was the vision of Woodrow Wilson's League of Nations, Franklin Roosevelt's United Nations, and potentially Jean Monnet's European Union. The populist or conservative view of globalism is that nations remain separate and sovereign, and international institutions are useful but limited. Nations provide for their own defense, but they live, they live side by side as sister republics with similar laws and institutions. And that's a quote from Thomas Jefferson, who once thought about other countries that might be formed in the Louisiana Territory, which he had just purchased. And he thought about them in terms of not of states that would have to be incorporated into the United States, but as potential sister republics that would live side by side with us with similar Republican laws and institutions. As open democracies, we find that countries do not threaten one another militarily. The example here is the democratic peace. All right, as originally foreseen by Jefferson and reinforced, I think, in recent decades by Harry Truman and Ronald Reagan. 
Now, Trump's nationalism, I think, is the populist variety. It is based on strong, self-reliant, democratic nationalism. It may be exactly the right formula to rein in the elitist globalism of recent decades, making American foreign policy less ambitious and interventionist than the foreign policy of George W. Bush, but also more patriotic, self-confident, and muscular than the foreign policy of Barack Obama. Now, my first point. Nationalism is not a dirty word. America first is, in fact, a good place to start. All nations, like individuals, begin with a primary responsibility for themselves. They cooperate where their interests overlap. They compete, but also accommodate where their interests conflict. Now, in this context, nationalism is not dismissive of values. It simply acknowledges that nations have different values. American values derive from its origins. The first country, by the way, to create a republic without a monarch, state church, or even a common history. The colonies related to England closer than they did to one another. That experiment, of course, in 1787, almost failed. It was made whole again by the Civil War and then went on to save freedom and self-government in the world three times in the 20th century, from monarchy in World War I, from fascism in World War II, and from communism in, world, in the Cold War. As Walter Russell Mead, a conservative scholar and commentator, wrote recently, and I quote, nationalism, the sense that Americans are bound together into a single people with a common destiny, is a noble and necessary force without which American democracy would fail, end quote. But many will ask, is nationalism enough? Can we, in fact, live in the world together simply on the basis of separate nationalisms? And the answer, I think, depends on how much national interests overlap. If national interests have, if nations have few values and interests in common, there will be little cooperation. If, on the other hand, they have more interests and values in common, they will cooperate. As I discussed in an earlier book, uh, one that uh, Robert didn't mention, but thank you, Robert, for mentioning the myth. Most people have forgotten about that one. Uh, but in an earlier book I wrote called At Home Abroad, I emphasized, I developed the idea that nations have two types of national interests. They have geographic interests that are fixed. America is the only great power separated from other great powers by two oceans. England and Japan are islands. Germany and Russia are land powers. Okay? But no nation is just a piece of geography or land. The easiest way to grasp that idea is to ask how many of us would fight for America if America were a dictatorship. So nations also have a second set of interests, political and ideological, ideological interests that define the values, the institutions, and the memories they seek to secure on their land, on their geography. These interests make up what I call their heartland, the territory where their hearts reside. Now, ideological interests change more readily than geographic ones. America is not the same political society today that it was in 1800. Same geography, but not the same political society. Well, not quite the same geography. We expanded a bit after 1800, but same part of the world. We're still separated by two oceans. France and Germany are not the same countries today that, that they were in the 19, uh, that they were in 1900, uh, 1900s. They are now uh, united in Europe rather than being divided as they were in 1900. So nations move together or apart depending mostly on their heartland interests given the fact that their land or their geographic interests don't change very much. Now, if nations have few heartland values in common, nationalism is going to pull them apart. It's not enough to ensure the peace. That was certainly the case in the 1930s. On the other hand, if heartland values overlap a lot, nationalism pulls countries together. That's the case, it seems to me, today with the democratic peace. All the major industrialized societies in the world today, and I'm excluding now Russia and China, they're not by any stretch of the imaginations uh, democratic societies, all, uh, although they're becoming industrialized societies, at least China is, but all major industrialized societies are democratic. In the 1990s, I mean, sorry, in the 1930s, there were relatively few democratic countries in the world, and European nations fought over different heartlands, fascism, communism, liberalism. Today, the heartland of all of Europe is whole and free. And for the first time, democracy is strong in Asia as well. Uh, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan. So it is not nationalism per se that matters. It's the ideological distance 
between nationalisms or among nationalisms that determine whether or not nationalism is a solid basis for a peaceful global world. Now here I'm borrowing from another colleague, Mark Haas at Duquesne University, uh, and from a wider school of thought in international relations that sees the world primarily in terms of political ideologies, not in terms of international institution, international institutions or the balance of power. I worked for a president, Ronald Reagan, who saw the world more in terms of ideas than power or institutions. Like Thomas Jefferson, he believed that the fundamental difference between nations was whether they decided their affairs by coercion or by consent. Authoritarian countries used force, republics used the ballot box. And if authoritarian governments used force on their own citizens, Reagan used to like to ask, how do you think they would treat us if they got their way? So authoritarian states threaten democratic states by virtue of who they are. In the same fashion, of course, democratic states threaten authoritarian states. Political leaders in authoritarian states wonder also how their own people might treat them if the example of democratic states comes too close to their borders. They might be thrown out of office or worse. This is why Vladimir Putin of Russia and Xi Jinping of China advocate openly the need to roll back the liberal Western order in Asia and in Europe. So the fundamental divide among nations is political, not military or diplomatic. Nations don't just struggle for power and then use democracy and authoritarianism to rationalize that struggle. They struggle for different political ideas and use the balance of power to defend themselves and international institutions to push their own political version of international law. One democratic law, the other a more authoritarian kind of law. Putin calls it diktat of law. So the difference in political ideologies among nations, or what Mark Haas calls ideological distance, defines the kind of inter international system that we have. Three types of systems are possible. First system is when ideological distance among nations is large. That is, countries are far apart in terms of political ideologies. Large ideological distance results in a realist or nationalist world. The realist world we had in the 19th century or the more virulent nationalist world we had in the 1930s. Nationalism in this context, in this world, is destructive of peace. But a second system is when ideological distance among nations is small. Small ideological distance results in a conservative internationalist world, the kind of world I would argue we have today. Conservative in the sense that all the major industrialized countries remain separate and sovereign, and global institutions by comparison are small and limited, but internationalist in the sense that countries are close to one another ideologically and do not threaten one another militarily. Nationalism in this context, I would argue, is constructive of peace. Now a third system is when ideological distance between nations is zero. That is when ideologies among nations merge and national interests become common interests. Zero ideological distance results in a liberal internationalist world. That is a world as represented by the U European Union or the United Nations, a world in which uh, a single government represents all of the relevant participants and members of that particular uh, society. Now, in such a world, nationalism actually disappears. One of the concerns, obviously, for some of the countries uh, in the European Union, most recently uh, Great Britain. Now, all of these international systems exist in the world at any given time. But the one that stands out for me today and the one I prefer is the conservative internationalist system. A system, as I've suggested, in which song, strong democratic nations lead, provide for their own defense, and ba balance power as needed to defend against authoritarian countries. And international institutions play a useful but supplementary role. Now my second point. American nationalism, I think, has had a lot to do with creating the conservative internationalist world we have today. As I discussed in a recent article in the American Interest, America's nationalism is different from traditional nationalism. It's based on four principles that distinguish it from traditional European or Asian nationalism. First, America exported self-government or republicanism, all right? not monarchy or imperialism. In the 18th and 19th centuries, 
European and Asian great powers dealt with the rest of the world through colonialism and imperialism. America opposed colonialism and with the one exception of the Philippines avoided it. After World War II, the United States led the campaign to decolonize the world and championed a universal system of self-government and human rights explicitly designed to counter the regional imperialism of colonial rule, as in the case of the British Commonwealth. If America exported imperialism, it was in fact an anti-imperialism, that is a promise to all nations of self-government and self-determination. Second, American nationalism did not celebrate a state church or any specific religious tradition. The First Amendment, and I note the very First Amendment, enshrined the principle of freedom of religious choice. By contrast, European powers, including the liberal ones, such as Great Britain and the Netherlands, developed their democracies on the basis of religious traditions, Anglican, Protestant, and in the case of France, Catholic traditions. America, by contrast, welcomed all religions and is comfortable in a world of multiple religions maybe most comfortable in a world of multiple, more comfortable than most other countries in a world of multiple religions. Third, American nationalism was always more open to trade than traditional European or Asian nationalism. European powers traded on the principle of mercantilism, as I mentioned earlier, the idea that it was better to export more goods to other countries than to import from them. Uh, the idea then was to use the surplus or profit uh, for military or imperial purposes. Now, although America at times imposed tariffs, especially in the 19th century when tariffs were the primary source of federal revenues, that is before the income tax, America enshrined from the start the principle of most favored nation in trade, the so-called MFN principle. It meant that the nation should be free to trade with all countries on the same terms, not just with certain privileged countries through colonial preferences. On this principle and the lowering of tariffs after World War II, the United, States, the United States built a free trading system that encouraged imports from other countries, not just exports, to other countries. Starting with Germany and Japan, our World War II enemies, the United States imported anywhere from 20, as high as 40% of the exports of these countries in the early decades. As a result, these countries recovered rather quickly and indeed in this period grew faster than the United States and became more powerful and in most cases more friendly to the United States. The United States continues to adhere to this principle uh, uh, to the present day, including in this somewhat risky gamble that we have taken uh, with respect to China. As a result, for the past 75 years, America, rel America's relative power has declined. Interesting. Our power has been declining ever since 1945. Uh, I argue that that was intentional. We're exporting anti-imperialism, and this is a reflection of that fact. America's DNA, in fact, I would argue, demands it. We believe in the equality of nations just as we believe in the equality of individuals. We did not seek empire as previous world powers did. We believed in republicanism, the basis of our own nationalism, democratic groups and nations living side by side, checking and balancing one another under guarantees of republican law. The hope was to trade off our relative power to bring other nations closer to us under democratic nationalism. The strategy of imperial decline, not imperial dominance, succeeded beyond anyone's uh, expectations. Fourth and finally, the United States, for all its racist faults, including the vicious struggle over, clay, over slavery, has been more, more open to immigration than any other country in the world. For 200 years, America was the living proof that peoples of any culture or race could live together free under a republican system that divided political power and protected individual rights. In the past 60 years, America has admitted 59 million legal and illegal immigrants. That is roughly one-fifth of our current population. Yes, we have some immigration issues, but compared to what? Germany admitted one million immigrants for one year in 2016 and then shut the door. This year, they'll admit less than 150,000. America is still the only true example of a multicultural democracy. Within a few years, we will, be, we will be the only major democratic country in the world with minorities comprising the majority. As the president I worked for, Ronald Reagan, once said, and I quote, whatever sad episodes exist in our past, any objective observer must hold a positive view of American history, a history that has been the story of hopes fulfilled and dreams made into reality, end quote. 
So American nationalism, based on these four principles, I argue, helped to create the world we have today. That world, as I've said before, contains more Republican or Democratic nations with more open markets and more tolerant society than ever before in history. Just think about the difference between Europe today and Europe in 1940 or in 1935. I like to think that the two presidents most responsible for this result were Harry, Har Harry Truman and Ronald Reagan. They were the bookend presidents of the Cold War who did the heavy lifting to create the world of the democratic speech, speech, peace, democratic peace, which they wanted because it didn't exist at their time, but which in fact became the world that we have today. They defined the Cold War as an ideological struggle, not a power struggle, and they gambled on freedom in a bunch of countries that were not free in 1945. West Germany, Japan, Spain, Portugal, Turkey, you could go on, South Korea, or even as late as 1985, countries of Eastern Europe. And they won that gamble in spectacular fashion. Now it seems to me the task is to preserve the democratic and economic gains of the past 75 years. Not to crusade for freedom in the same manner in which Harry Truman and Ronald Reagan did, uh, but rather to um, defend freedom where it exists uh, and to be very careful about trying to spread it uh, too ambitiously in other parts of the world, um, such as we have tried to do recently in Afghanistan and Iraq. So let me go to my third point. Trump's nationalism may be, may be perfectly tailored. I'll have some caveats on this in a minute, so don't think I'm Trump drunk or whatever. Uh, Trump's nationalism may be perfectly tailored to consolidate the enormous gains we have made now in the past 75 years and to preserve this conservative internationalist world that we have today. Nationalisms among major industrial countries are closer than ever. It's so easy to forget that. It's just think back 75 or 100 years to think how easy it is, how much easier it is for America to operate in the world today with all these democracies. We have our differences, to be sure, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a difference between night and day if you have a historical perspective on this. Nationalisms among these industrialized countries are closer than ever before. They create a large zone of contemporary international affairs where interests overlap. Not a lot, uh, not a little, but a lot. And in that sense, nationalisms do not pull countries apart today. Rather, they create a solid basis for cooperation. But equal wealth and power among democratic nations also means equal responsibilities. We are now about 75 years away from the end of World War II. America's democratic allies are proud and powerful nations, wealthy and fully democratic. As Trump argues, we should demand more from them. They should spend more on their own defense. They should import more goods. Strong and open nations make strong allies not nations that uh, seek to shirk their responsibilities in alliances or international institutions. Now, in a conservative internationalist world, therefore, in which many free countries live peacefully with one another, there is less need for an ambitious American foreign policy. Here's where Trump's instincts, I think, are correct. The American people decided in 2008 that President George W. Bush probably went too far when he declared in his second inaugural address that it was the policy of the United States to pursue democracy and, demo and democratic movements in every nation and culture uh, with the ultimate objective of ending tyranny in our world, end quote. The objective, the people sensed, was much more modest, to defend, not crusade for freedom, and, and if possible, to maintain open trade. But the people also decided in 2016 that defense did not mean retreat. They wanted a more positive, self-confident foreign policy to deal with the aggression of Russia and China and Ukraine and South China Sea, to thwart the efforts of rogue states to acquire nuclear weapons, and to defeat the terrorist ideology in the Middle East and Afghanistan. Trump's nationalism may provide the appropriate corrective, it seeks a new balance between a too ambitious foreign policy that advances democracy by military intervention uh, throughout the world, and a too complacent foreign policy that expects history to move events our way without our having to invest much military or economic power of our own. Now, here come the caveats. Let me be clear. I can't be entirely sure what Trump's policy is. You know the old saw that nobody knows what Donald Trump is thinking, even if his name is Donald Trump. Uh, and that, so the, I, I acknowledge the fact that there's still a lot of unknowns here. But instinctively or intentionally, I think Trump's approach is timely. It promotes America first, but as his aides now, McMaster and Cohn, his national security and national economic advisors, 
as they say in an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal, America first never meant America alone. America is comfortable among strong nations, and Trump himself has said in his folksy cadence, hey, quote, I am both a nationalist and a globalist, end quote. But he seeks a globalism that is built on nationalism, on the democratic nationalism which is so strong today, and which is, I think, the unique characteristic of the world today. Not a globalism that replaces nationalism. In this sense, he is a conservative and a nationalist, like Ronald Reagan. Not a liberal internationalist, like Woodrow Wilson. Now, in a conservative internationalist world, America has to do two things, I would argue. And then I want to measure Trump's policies against these two things. All right, the first thing we need to do is to defend the central borders of freedom in Europe and Asia, which it has cost us a great deal of time and treasure in order to develop, in order to create. All right, that means that we've got to support our allies in Europe and in Asia, and we have to compete, continue to compete with Russia and China over these questions of freedom versus authoritarianism uh, in critical areas along those borders. Now, the two critical areas are Ukraine in Europe and the Korean Peninsula in Asia. These two conflicts are priorities in a conservative internationalist world. Why? Because a loss of freedom on these borders is a major setback, more so than would be a loss of freedom in Iraq or Afghanistan. We, lose, we, we risk losing everything we fought for now for the last 75 years if we start seeing the borders of freedom move backwards in Europe and in Asia. But the second thing America has to do in this new conservative internationalist world is to recognize that it doesn't have to crusade for freedom in other places of the world. That three, world, three wars, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq, have demonstrated, I think, that trying to spread democracy in these regions is a bridge too far. There are few prerequisites of democracy in these countries and no nearby democracies to backstop their development. Well, thus, the defeat of, thus in these regions, I argue, we should, not, we should, def, we should t address threats. We should deal with threats that emerge, such as the terrorist threat, but we should not stick around to build nations. A loss of democracy or a lack of democracies in these regions would not register a major blow uh, to the conservative internationalist world that uh, we wish to preserve. Now, how well does Trump's policy measure up against these two requirements? I'm going to conclude that, um, no, wait a minute. I'm going to conclude that it measures up pretty well. Uh, let's just take a look at sort of the different regions in which he has been operating. And by the way, let's take a look at what he has done, less than so than at what he has said, or how he has said it. All right, I'm assessing him on the basis of what I see him actually doing. Uh, he's very unorthodox, obviously, as we know, in presidential style, and everybody seems to be completely um, flustered and maybe often off target because they pay, um, th th they're unwilling to look at the constellation of things that he has actually done. What about in Central Europe? What about the central purpose of trying to strengthen NATO? Well, look, uh, Trump, it, it's pretty clear to me, remains as committed to NATO as any um, American president has over the course of the last 75 years, even though he said last year during the campaign it was obsolete. What am I talking about? Well, his trip to Europe, I think, was a big success, even though he was criticized for not affirming Article 5 of the NATO treaty. And that Article 5, you know, declares an attack on one member as an attack against all members. All right, but Trump did not downplay Article 5. Here's you know, something very subtle happened while he was in Europe that very few people caught. He focused instead, he went to Europe to focus on Europe's commitment to Article 5, not America's commitment to Article 5. He's trying to buck up the allies and trying to make the allies understand they've got a bigger role now that they have to play. So what did he do? He opened up his NATO speech. Very first thing he mentions is the good thing that the Europeans did when they invoked Article 5 for the only time in the history of Article 5. That was after 9-11. Unfortunately, the United States didn't accept the offer, which was a big mistake. Uh, but he praised the Europeans for doing this, that that's the kind of allies we're looking for. Then, of course, he went on to demand that the allies increase their defense spending and meet their commitments to spend 2% of GDP on defense, which they have repeatedly made but repeatedly failed to fulfill. He upbraided them rather publicly and ungraciously um, in front of NATO headquarters. Quite frankly, even though 
or maybe because I'm a big supporter of the Alliance, I thought the scolding was appropriate and long overdue. What was completely admissed, however, was something that was going on while Trump was in Europe and nobody seemed to notice. Before going to Europe, he had fully reaffirmed America's, America's commitment to the NATO decision made last year to station permanently Western forces on the border of Russia in the Baltics and Poland for the first time since 1991. That was a huge decision. By the way, Obama gets some credit for that. NATO made a decision last year to put permanently NATO forces on the border of these countries that are potentially threatened by Russia uh, for the first time uh, since 1991. Now, that decision, as I say, was huge. This deployment of a NATO brigade, including a U.S. battalion of 1,000 troops, did more to reinforce America's, America's commitment to Article 5 than any words Trump might have spoken. Now American soldiers are on the ground in Estonia, Latvia, and Lith Lithuania, and Poland. If Russia invades these countries, as it did Ukraine, American soldiers will die. That triggers the American commitment to defend Europe. Amazingly, even conservative commentators miss this. When he got back to Washington, Trump right, right away reaffirmed Article 5 in the Rose Garden. Later, he goes to Poland, and he reaffirms it in glowing words. Why didn't he do it in Europe? Well, it was pretty consistent with his purpose of being in Europe. And that was to tell the Europeans what their responsibilities were, not to get dragged into a discussion about our responsibilities. I think, you know, there's some evidence that this has had a real impact in Europe, again, missed by the press. Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, you know, a key partner in NATO, she had this to say after Trump left. She said, and I quote, the times in which we could totally rely on others are to some extent over. We Europeans must really take our fate into our own hands. Now listen very closely to what she is saying. She says the times in which we could totally rely on others. She's admitting that they're free riding totally on the United States in their own defense. But then secondly, she goes on to say, those times of totally relying on others are to some extent over. To some extent. They're not over. America's still there. Trump didn't pull the rug out from under America's commitment to NATO. She knows it's still there. Right? And now finally she says we Europeans must really take our fate into our own hands. Maybe she really got the message. Maybe she understands that now they need to do more. Uh, and um, uh, I, 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 you know, in my judgment, that was exactly the message that uh, Trump was trying to get across. Now, the second objective of Europe is to compete with Russia and Ukraine. Trump's approach here is still a question mark. It's not clear exactly what he's going to do. He now has a special envoy who happens to, by the way, be a former student of mine at the Elliott School, Kurt Volker, a distinguished uh, member of the Foreign Service who was also our ambassador to NATO. Um, and he is examining all the aspects of our uh, uh, policies towards uh, Ukraine. Um, the question is whether or not we try to stabilize the military situation on the ground in Ukraine. Ukraine, of course, is not a member of NATO, so there's no commitment to defend Ukraine. But whether we should, there's a huge imbalance right now in the military capabilities of the Russians who are in the eastern part of Ukraine and, and the rest of Ukraine. So the question is, do we help the Kiev government to try to stabilize, balance some of those requirements, uh, some of those military uh, deficiencies uh, in the hopes not of expelling Russia from uh, the Ukraine, from Crimea, or from Donbass, the eastern region, but rather for the purpose of getting them to take the negotiations in Geneva seriously. There are negotiations going on, the so-called Minsk II negotiations. They're led, by the way, by France and Germany. Good, good thing to do to have the allies up on the front lines. Um, and um, the Russians at this point aren't paying any attention at all. Why should they? The things are going their way on the ground. They could push forward any time in uh, the eastern part of Ukraine, take another third of the country if they wanted to. Um, I think Putin would do that if he found an opportunity. If we got distracted by something, you know, or if we got involved, not distracted, but we got involved in something in Asia, a big military operation, I, I don't know, uh, you know whether, or, whether or not we wouldn't see uh, Putin uh, uh, move further. So somehow you're going to have to stabilize this military situation on the ground in Ukraine before anybody's going to get serious. Now, what should the negotiations be? I don't think they should provide for uh, Ukraine membership in NATO or in the EU anytime soon, but it should hold out that option in the future. Just as we held that option out for Germany, all right, during the Cold War, we said, no, Germany has the right to make a decision as to whether it wants to be part of the West or a part of the East. 
we should hold that same option out, it seems to be, for uh, Ukraine. Asia, Trump, I think, has been has performed, uh, I can't find really, maybe in the question and answer period, I can find one flaw, I'm sorry, but I can't find many flaws in his, in his uh, policy towards Asia. He's done exactly what you might have hoped he would do if we're going to really uh, address the Korean problem, uh, and, and hopefully peacefully. Uh, he, first of all, has stayed very, very close to Japan and has a very tight alliance with Japan, and Japan is doing a lot more, by the way, for its own defense than it ever has in the past. Um, and that's critical because Japan is the country now most directly threatened. I mean, they've had missiles going over the, their territory already. We're worried about that in the case of Hawaii and the West Coast, but J Japan has had that happen already a couple of times. He's been very adept, I think, in dealing with South Korea. There we have a new president who's actually more dovish, and Trump somehow or other persuaded him to continue to uh, implement, uh, to deploy this missile defense system that the president, the South Korean president, uh, initially uh, uh, suspended uh, for a while, um, and he has um, continued to strengthen the uh, military uh, capabilities uh, of the both the South Korean and the Japanese. That is, they've been exercising a lot militarily. All right, just to put the North Koreans and the Chinese on notice that we've got these capabilities to take care of ourselves. Uh, strengthening, by the way, some of our uh, strengthening further the missile defense system, the so-called THAAD system, and also beginning to think about increasing our own uh, missile defense capabilities here on the West Coast, where we have only something like 40 interceptors deployed. Trump wants to increase that by, uh, by threefold. Uh, he's raised the stakes with China. This problem with North Korea is not going to be solved peacefully without China. And he has raised the stakes with China by saying, look, you, you don't want this North Korean problem to wreck the deal we've got going in the world economy, or direct the agreement that we have on a one China policy. But if you don't help us solve this North Korean problem, we don't have any obligation to continue on with this one China policy, all right? nor do we have an obligation to treat you fairly in the international economic system. I mean, all bets are off if you don't help us with this problem. Well, I think he's gotten the attention of Beijing. I mean, Beijing has been doing things in the last six months they've never done before. Now, you know, they may not follow through, and this may not work, but it's the only way that this problem can be addressed, it seems to me, um, you know, without, uh, without war. Uh, by the way, you have to have the threat of war there. Trump's pretty good at that, isn't he? My president was pretty good at that, too. President Reagan, who, who knew exactly what he was doing, he later wrote about it and said, with malice of forethought, he called the Soviet Union evil empire. With malice of forethought, he knew that mic was open, and he said, we're going to bomb Russia in five minutes. He wanted to get a message across. You know, you got somebody different here, and uh, he may not be as dependable or reliable as you think. And I think that's not a bad message, all right? I mean, I don't want it to be the message, but I want it to be a part of the message. Um, now, the one thing he hasn't done is uh, dealt with the economic situation. The one real sort of bad piece of his policy, in my judgment, is his threat to end the free trade agreement with South Korea. I mean, give me a break. Uh, in the middle of a strategic crisis, you're going to threaten the... This may be a negotiating tactic, and I hope it is, but it was not very timely uh, when, he, uh, you know, when he made that case. Afghanistan, and let me quickly here um, move to a conclusion. In Afghanistan, I think, um, again, Trump is... Let's look at sort of his policies and. Now, the remote regions where we want to address terrorism, but we don't want to get involved in nation building, uh, he's done exactly the right thing, I think, in Afghanistan. He's added a few more troops, all right? They're embedded with uh, the forces to try to help and advise and so on, but he avoided or he refrained from introducing large numbers of troops, and he's indicated that that's very much against his instincts to do that sort of thing. Uh, he authorized a more aggressive use of helicopters. Uh, but the question is, is that going to change things very much? And here's where the really sticky problem comes in Afghanistan. We're losing the war in Afghanistan right now. Taliban control about maybe 40% of the territory. They only controlled 15% uh, three, three, four years ago. So this isn't likely going to be enough to defeat the Taliban. But it may be enough to keep them off balance. The thing we have to concentrate on, and I think this is in Trump's mind, can't be sure, is that we need to prevent the Taliban from controlling territory where they can set up training bases and train terrorists to dispatch around the world. That's what happened, after all, in the case of 9-11. Uh, and I think if we can keep them off balance with offshore operations from time to time by 
trying, and it's a very long haul, and it may not work, but trying to make the Afghan army more effective, um, I think we can satisfy that interest. That's a very limited interest. We don't have to make a democ democracy out of, uh, out of Afghanistan. Iraq, war's going much better. In fact, it may have ended uh, today, according to the New York Times. At least they've taken Raqqa, or most of Raqqa, and the ISIS has disappeared. But now the real problem reemerges. Who's going to control the territory that we've taken back from ISIS? And what do we do about all these tribal conflicts uh, in the Middle East? Uh, the one thing I hope we don't do, and I don't think uh, Trump will do, is put another 150,000 American forces in there and, and put the crosshairs on our back. Uh, rather, to try to encourage a coalition of Arab countries, which he's doing, uh, both to provide some ground forces where we need them to bolster the Arab and uh, the Syrian and Iraqi forces that we support, um, to um, cut out the financial support that's going from some of these Gulf Arab countries like Qatar uh, to the uh, terrorists, and generally to support a coalition against Iran, because Iran is fomenting a lot of this terrorist and tribal instability in Iraq and Syria, with the hope eventually of establishing a land bridge whereby they can supply all kinds of military resources uh, to both the Syrian government, the Lebanese government, and to Hamas, all right, for purposes of establishing uh, a balance of power very much in their favor vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, Israel and the moderate Arab uh, states. Uh, Trump did the right thing, I think, in staying in the nuclear agreement, but saying that the objective now is not just to certify whether they're abiding by the nuclear agreement, but both to broaden and extend the nuclear agreement. That is, broaden it to include these activities that um, Iran is doing outside the nuclear agreement, like its missile programs and so on, uh, and to broaden the agreement to include now the period, that is to start some negotiations with respect to the period after all these deadlines uh, come about. I mean, the agreement only holds uh, you know, only restrains Iran in the short term, eight years, 10 years, 15 years. So Trump is saying, okay, what are we going to do now? Let's open the negotiations uh, as to what's going to happen after that, those eight years, 10 years, or 15 years. Now, I don't want to leave the impression that Trump's policies are without defects, as I've already said. Some of his policies are still unclear. And I think so far he's missed a very, very important, maybe even linchpin of his entire strategy. And that is his economic policy. Unfortunately, he did not give it priority in the first six months of his administration. He turned to the health care um, um, legislation uh, unsuccessfully. Uh, now he's having more difficulty than he might have had had he put the economic program up front because this is a prerequisite for everything else he wants to try to do. That is, he's got to get 3 or 4 percent growing growth in the American economy, again, over the next several years, if he's going to manage any of these issues that he's concerned about. Certainly if he's going to increase uh, defense spending, certainly if he's going to increase jobs and maybe alleviate some of the tensions over immigration, et cetera, um, uh, and, and generally to build a spirit of momentum and, and, and movement and progress, he's going to need that economic uh, success. Uh, whether he can now do that, uh, I hope there's still time, uh, but uh, he has wasted pre precious time uh, by, uh, 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 I think, uh, falsely and wrongly prioritizing um, the health care plan. So, in conclusion, Trump's foreign policy provides, I think, a reasonable mix for today's world of nationalism and globalism. It's rooted in some pretty sound principles, strong Republican nationalism, not centralized international institutions, unaccountable, by the way, international institutions. Not a single international institution elects any official, that's true of the EU too, um, um, by the people. That is, uh, they're completely unaccountable to the, pe uh, to the people at large. Globalism, he, his, another, his principles include globalism based on small ideological differences among nations, because in today's world, nationalisms are closer than ever before, especially among the democratic countries. Defense and support of freedom on the major borders of freedom uh, in um, Europe and Asia, in Ukraine and Korea. Defeat of the terrorists, but no nation building or democracy promotion in remote re regions. And finally, revival of the economy and the defense buildup, uh, which I think is the prerequisite for all the others. So a globalism rooted in nationalism is not only long overdue, I think it makes a lot of sense in today's world. Uh, and, um, you know, it's pretty clear that the American people are looking for something
uh, for some new mix uh, of these uh, two approaches in our foreign policy. Well, let me stop there as usual and being a talkative academic. You remember what Dwight Eisenhower once said about academics is that, oh, they, those are those people that use a lot of words and take a long time to tell you more than they know. <laughs> Eisenhower, was, Eisenhower was pretty sharp. <laughs> so I've, I've taken too long and probably told you more than I know. But why don't I open it up to questions and comments? Mm -hmm. Sure, I'll be happy to do that. Yeah, Dave. Please. Mm -hmm. So, what is the relationship between domestic politics and how does domestic politics select foreign policy doctrine? Is that a thing that voters do? Well, uh, yes, it's always a question of how important are the foreign policy issues in any campaign compared to other issues. And I have colleagues, obviously, who question whether or not. The 2008 election repudiated George W. Bush's foreign policy. They say it was mostly about the financial crisis and mostly about the economic policies of the W. Bush administration. So these are all matters of judgment and argument. Uh, foreign policies generally, foreign policy issues generally don't matter as much as domestic policy issues. But there is a referendum. The, the, the you know a, a an administration's foreign policy is up for some kind of assessment and evaluation. And, and, and uh, conservative uh, approach. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, but I do think it's a factor. I, 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 think, I think it does get um, foreign policy, policy, foreign policies get reviewed in campaigns no less than domestic policies. Yes, please. Well, boy, I mean, it's hard because, uh, you know, uh, Trump is vulnerable clearly to criticism that he's not really addressing aggressively enough the terrorist problem because the Taliban, as I say, is expanding. Um, and they do already control substantial territory. Now, I don't know the extent to which we can monitor that territory and where and when we see things that look like camps, we just blow the hell out of them, even if they're underground. We use our blockbusters to just try to keep the terrorists off balance so that they can't get any momentum. Eventually, you'd like to see the battle on the ground turned around in favor of the Afghan forces. But frankly, they're going to have to do that on their own. The Afghan forces are going to have to get better. And we can help them, and we are helping them. And I think the troops that have been primarily trained by us and have had some time now to gain experience in fighting. They're doing pretty well, but they're just small in number. And whether we can expand that uh, very much is not clear because, you know, these are the best and the brightest of the, of the military uh, troops that we're working with. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that, that you know, look, we, we, we take the chance that something could come out of Afghanistan again that could attack us. And in that case, then it's going to be all bets off again, and we'll probably march back into Afghanistan with large numbers of troops. I mean, I, my feeling is that, and I, I make this case, we've had three experiences now, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. 
And I think those experiences should tell us that if we can't get in and out in three or four years, we better not go in. We better find a, s a second line of defense against the problem. So I'm hoping we can have a more aggressive drone, airstrike, um, periodic operations from offshore where we inject an operational team, a SEAL team or something and get a target uh, uh, demolished, that we can make some incremental progress in expanding the Afghan army's capability. Maybe we can at least stop this advance that the Taliban has made and slowly begin to reverse it. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put the kind of emphasis on Afghanistan that we have put up till this point. I would say that, you know, even if the worst happened uh, and the Taliban took over again, uh, we'd have to marshal our capabilities to, um, you know, to strike at any of their attempted terrorist uh, activities. But, we, 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 you know, we could probably live with that if, 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 if that happened. And what if we put 150,000 troops back in there and then we had to do the same thing in Iraq because Iraq also falls apart at some point. And then we have the possibility of a war on the peninsula in Korea. But we've got to have some sense about what we can do and what we can't do. So I'm willing to say that, and this isn't popular in Washington, especially not among my conservative friends, uh, that we not sort of you know, follow through and do it right this time in Afghanistan and Iraq. That's what I always hear. Let's do it right this time. The American people will always follow you if, you, if you're successful. Well, I mean, look, how many, how many um, you know, whacks at the pitata do you get? I mean, uh, it seems to me we've had a couple and the American people have said that's enough. Yeah. Go to your human rights for just a minute. If Russia couldn't handle Afghanistan, if we can't handle Afghanistan, would it make sense pulling out, let the Iranians come in and give them the problem for 10, 15 years? <laughs> yeah, you know, of course, you make a good point about geography, and that is that Iran sits right between, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan. So here we were, you know, heavily engaged in the two countries on, the, on either side of Iran. For a while, I think Iran felt like when we were in there and, and when we were being successful, we were kind of doing their bidding, so to speak. We were fighting their wars. You know, I don't want to advocate. Um, I think we need to be worried about terrorism. And, and Iran is a very blatant, open supporter of terrorism throughout the Middle East. Uh, and I think Trump is, so, you know, I don't, Obama made the decision, and, and we'll see how history treats that decision, that he didn't want to deal with all these other problems with Iran. He wanted to focus on the nuclear problem because that was the existential problem. Um, and that uh, if he could solve the, Europe, the nuclear problem, as he thinks he did in this agreement, this JPOAC or whatever it's called, uh, then, he would be, then Iran would, be, would start acting more moderately in all of these other areas. It would change the character of their internal debate and they would realize that America is not their adversary and so they would stop doing some of the stuff that they're doing in Syria and in Lebanon and other places to promote Yemen, to promote terrorism. Well, it hasn't happened so far now. The agreement's been in place for two years and we've seen an actual increase in Iranian activity, an increase also in their missile development, which isn't covered by the agreement, but it is covered under sanctions uh, by the UN. Um, so, um, I think we have to have a strategy for, con for keeping the pressure on Iran. I think Trump's first visit, uh, which was to the Middle East for the purpose of rallying these Arab Gulf states in particular to kind of think hard about the future that they want in their region, and they're going to have to start putting more uh, boots on the ground in order to secure that future. I think that was a good move. I think his uh, criticism now and his efforts to try to uh, renegotiate or nego or broaden and extend the nuclear agreement is the right move to try to contain Iran. I'd like to see us stay in Afghanistan on a, a reasonable basis um, um, and, and, and at least keep pounding away at the Taliban. So it seems to me we could, there, it's possible to have a kind of hold the line strategy, all right, which addresses our principal interest, which is terrorism. Um, increasingly, by the way, we're less dependent on oil from the Middle East. Increasingly, these other factors are going to be less important with time. Uh, the major concerns are going to be terrorism and then our friendship with Israel.
uh, and I think it's going to be very hard, nor would I want to see the day come when the United States, as long as Israel doesn't provoke a war, we always have that problem with allies, you know, they might get us into a war that we don't want. Um, um, I, you know, I, I, I want us to stand by Israel, uh, and, um, and, and so those become the two big interests that we have in the region within 20 years or so. Uh, No, I think, I mean, it's a good point. It, it, they don't figure centrally in terms of where the major battles for freedom are going to be won or lost in the next 25 years. Um, nor are they a source at this stage of serious terrorist, um, you know, threats to us. Um, I, I come back to my concern with Trump, which is his economics and his trade policy, because the, the basis for our relationship to those parts of the world has always been our the global economy and our effort to try to move these countries in the direction of thinking about becoming a part of that global economy. The countries that have done that, Chile, now most recently Mexico, they have made enormous progress. The countries that didn't, Venezuela, you see what's happened. Um, and so I think we want to, that's the leading edge of our strategy towards the developing country, it continues to be that world economy. now. Is, is Trump, you know, taking these positions on trade in order as a negotiating position, all right, because he wants some better agreements, and he's right about that, by the way. The agreements in the past always favored our allies. That's the point I made about how we help them grow stronger, grow faster. We wanted that. It's been a successful policy, but now they can bear more of the responsibilities. So we need to, if not renegotiate these agreements, negotiate some new agreements that do a better job of, from the standpoint of our interests. But we need to keep markets open, and we need to keep markets open on an MFN basis, all right? Not start carving up the world into a whole bunch of bilateral agreements. Now, you know, Trump has said he likes bilateral, all right? I hope he likes bilateral as a negotiating tactic, because that's important. You know, you, while you're negotiating NAFTA, you go to Ottawa and you make a deal with the Canadians, and then you spring it on the Mexicans, and you do the same, and a lot of that bilateral stuff, because in the bilateral context, we have a big advantage. I mean, we're the big market. Uh, so he wants to kind of reduce the dilution of our negotiating ability that happens in the multilateral arenas. If that's what he's about, I'm all for it. Uh, again, I have to say, I don't know how strategic his thinking is. Uh, if, if he's actually about trying to create a world of more bilateral agreements, then he's undercutting all right, um, all of his other efforts uh, to try to support our allies, to try to um, you know, squeeze North Korea. I mean, none of this makes sense if we're going to, if we're going to significantly alter or reverse, put into reverse the kind of global economy that we have uh, created in the last 75 years. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yeah, we, you know, I, I think I said it, it's been a struggle. It's been a struggle throughout our history. But like President Reagan, I think we've made a lot of progress. And I think we've made a lot of progress in the last 30, 40 years. I mean, I grew up in the South. I don't know what people are talking about if they don't think we've made progress on race relations in this country. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, it's true, by the way, in the North as well. Um, we have made significant progress. There is plenty more to make. And Charlottesville reflects that. Uh, I didn't think Trump, by the way, was too far off the mark on Charlottesville. I understand how. He simply said that, look, there's violence on the left and the right. There was violence on the left there. And I don't like Stalinists any more than I like Nazis. And it seems to me we ought to be even-handed about that. But they are the extremes. Why do we let the extremes in this case define the central problem that we face in this country? We have made so much progress in the center of this country, that is not on the wings, but in the center. Uh, that I think we, sh we, 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 you know, I think we need to, we can't, I, don't want, us to, I want us to take into account, by the way, the media will, will not let us uh, ignore uh, the extremes, that's their bread and butter, but I, I, don't, I don't think we should let it cloud our judgment about where we are in this 
battle, in this battle against race, in the battle against sexism, all of these things that we've taken on. I can't believe what the United States has tried to do in the last 50 years. Name one other country in this world that has taken on a civil rights revolution that has done what we have done with the emancipation and with the employment of women in this country. By the way, in the 1950s, less than a quarter of our women worked. Today, more than three quarters work. Where did all those jobs come from? How did that happen? Um, look at the progress we've made from the days of the Civil Rights Revolution. Um, immigration. Did you get the figure that I can check me out on that? Because it's a valid figure. 60 million immigrants in 50, 59 million immigrants in 60 years. I mean, it's phenomenal. No other country would do this. We do it and then we say, oh my God, we got problems. Of course we have problems. Um, and by the way, we led the free world in a very costly and dangerous campaign against communism. And we succeeded. Now name any other country that's been through that kind of a crucible over the last 50 years. Can't we stop for a moment and pat ourselves on the back? I don't want to stop there. I want to move forward. And uh, Trump is not going to be our apostle of you know, uh, our theologian of race relations in this country. Sadly enough, I don't think Obama was either. He had, he had a real opportunity in this case, and maybe he fell uh, quite short of it too. But on the other hand, I don't think we're in, you know, we're, we're worse off than we've ever been in this regard. I hope we have, you know, a, a, a capability to kind of make the right assessment, address it, address it vigorously, but don't take it out of context and don't destroy the progress. I happened to say to my dean just the other day, because we, we're all facing this question, you know, especially this issue of diversity and inclusion on campuses and so on. And, uh, I, you know, all of us want that. But I told him, you know, the, the next step we're going to have to ask ourselves, and we should be asking ourselves now, is diversity and inclusion for what? Let's put something on the table that we want to do together. What do we have in common? The more we emphasize diversity, um, the more we're going to divide. Identity politics ends up in division. We have to ask, what are we as a country? What do we want to achieve? Well, I mean, there are a lot of things I think we could do together and we should be doing together. We should be talking about that. We should be trying to bring diversity and inclusion to bear on those problems, not simply to fight it in the abstract, this is my judgment now, and, um, and let it just continue to divide us because you know, you made the point rather graphically. I told him, I said, well, I can leave my university and think of myself just as a white male European Christian and probably dead in a few decades or you know, who knows, maybe sooner. Uh, but do I, is, that, is that the way I want to leave the room? Is that the way I want to leave the discussion? No, I want to know why, why do we, what, do we, what can we work on with our greater diversity and our greater inclusion? What are those key issues and problems? Let's go to work on them. So we need to define some goals here that bring us together. Uh, we will. I have great faith in this country. I, I have given the progress that I've seen in my life, um, uh, and, and, and you know, I would urge too, uh, you know, especially young people, I do that in my classroom, uh, know the history of the country uh, you know, over the last 50 years. As, as bad as some aspects of it have been, know the history, and you cannot deny, I think, as, Reagan says you can't come away from this picture of America and all of its struggles and its continuing struggles without a positive feeling about America. We can do it. And by the way, if we don't have that positive feeling, if we can't acknowledge the progress we've made in the past, we will make no progress in the future. It's as simple as that. You've got to inspire. You've got to strengthen. You've got to bring people together. So I'm waiting for somebody. I think it's going to happen the next five years, somebody comes going to come along out there and say, okay, here's what we need to do together. And I mean very concrete. I don't I haven't, you know, these are the things we're going to focus on. Now, we need women to do that. We need men. We need blacks. We need Hispanics. We need Asians. They bring this and they bring that and we're going to all get together. Uh, then we will have crossed maybe the, the next, um, you know, boundary in this, in this ongoing struggle. And it will always be an ongoing struggle. People are not angels and they aren't no. Yes, ma'am. What Trump's what? Uh, choices. Oh, choices, yeah. 
Right. Right. Well, I mean, you know, I, I'm not um, either involved in the intelligence community or, or, or privy to any of that information. So, but I do know what is reported uh, publicly, and, and, and we are looking for ways to counter uh, any kind of action by the North Koreans along the border. Now we're thinking about conventional or, you know, even small nuclear uh, weapons. Ways to do that while uh, sparing the population. The population in Seoul is, of course, you know what, 25 miles away from the border. I've been across that border, in fact, and it's 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 horrendous. It, it I crossed the border in Central Europe many times, and I always wanted to, you know, do a documentary or something so I could show my students forever what that was like. Uh, because we forget. I mean, it was like going from, from, you know, heaven to hell, if you want to put it in simple terms. I and mean, it was like going from a prosperous world to one in which there was hardly anything. This was true in Europe, uh, let alone now in Korea. When I went up to the Kaesong Industrial Park in North Korea, about 30 miles maybe beyond the um, demilitarized zone, we noticed that there were no trees anywhere. None. Zero. It was just these hills. Of course, eroding, and they have lots of problems with floods and so on. And uh, we asked about it, and we were told that, um, not by the North Koreans, but by people on our side, that you could go all the way up to Pyongyang, and you would see very, very few hills that had trees on them. One very simple reason. That's what the people have to use for heat and for food, that is, for fuel, to cook. They have nothing else. It's the most totally poor and devastated country you can imagine. And, of course, spending millions and billions of dollars on, uh, 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 you know, on military. Uh, now, you know, there are other things that I, I hope we're doing. I mean, we're trying to obviously strengthen our missile defenses. Uh, and someday they're going to, they, they may already be quite good. All right. We don't hear a lot about them because, you know, uh, they better work. <laughs> they're kind of thing that, you know, you can't have too many failures. So, I'm hoping that we're doing that. We're putting in the THAAD system. We're probably going to put in another battery or two of this. The, this, this deals with intermediate range cruise missiles and, 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 and other missiles. Our defenses on ICBMs, which is what we're worried about in the case of an attack maybe on the uh, American mainland, uh, are, are very meager. And they've been meager because Congress, for a long period of time, have been cutting defense spending, and especially for our missile defense programs. So Trump wants to turn that around. He wants to put more of these interceptors in. This is to take care of now long-range missiles when they're in the, uh, not in the early boost phase, but in the re-entry phase or in the, uh, you know, the flight phase. Um, I think we're, we're, I hope, we're, we're expediting a lot of that stuff. I also know that we're doing a lot on cyber warfare uh, to try to both counter some attempt or any attempt by the North Koreans to do an EMP thing, kind of, you know, where they would, um, and, and possibly to retaliate in one way or another, uh, should they do something short of that. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit um, conflicted in a way because for domestic reasons, I'm a little bit upset with our intelligence community and with our NSA and all the surveillance, and I'm libertarian in that respect. I worry about our civil rights and whether or not the uh, intelligence community uh, respects that sufficiently uh, and reports to Congress, you know, vigor, you know, uh, uh, carefully on, on many of those issues. On the other hand, I realize that we've got to do some pretty unpleasant things or we've got to think about doing some very unpleasant things, which can only be done secretly and, uh, and, and um, you know, without uh, public knowledge. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic about the North Korean situation. I don't think that we're likely to see a major conflict. Um, I hope, I, I think the real issue here is going to be these, these sanctions are really big. I think they're going to really take effect, by the way. You know, we've just introduced so-called secondary sanctions, that is, where we've said it's not only American companies that we are sanctioning, but we're going to sanction companies from any country, including China, who negotiate, or I mean who trade with the North Koreans. So this should, now it's going to take some time, but this should begin to bite. Um, I think China, I, I can't come up with a reason why China would not um, want to resolve this matter short of war. Now, they do like the fact that North Korea causes us a lot of problems. And they do like the fact that North Korea keeps South Korea from being on their border. And therefore, the US alliance from being on their border. Uh, 
But um, I think they'd be willing, and I hope we're doing this with China, to talk a bit about what are the stages, what are the incremental stages in which we could see some change in North Korea as a result of the sanctions. In other words, some change, maybe not immediately a change at the top, uh, but some config reconfiguration of the elites in North Korea that would begin to move them in a somewhat more moderate direction. Maybe in the longer run, um, a, ch a change in the basic regime, but that's in the long run. But we need to be talking with, to China about what those incremental steps could be. Because it's got to involve some kind of a change, some kind of a moderation uh, of the regime in uh, Pyongyang. Uh, whether that can be done within the framework of the uh, Kim family and the Kim dynasty and the Kim legacy, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I hope it can. I'd like to see it done in the context of the Kim legacy because I think that's so deeply embedded in North Korea that uh, you're not going to change it without a long period of time or without some eventual use of force. But um, I hope it can. I hope it can happen. Yes, ma'am. Um, do you have any particular ally in mind? Well, I guess like maybe like, like even like the Scottish revolutionary movement, whatever, uh, uh. and what they're doing right. with that. Right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, of course, in the Middle East, we, I mean, Trump, you know, has sort of forged a new friendship with, with Saudis, or with whom Obama had some real difficulties, because they are very much afraid of Iran, and they didn't think Obama was doing enough about Iran and they oppose the Iranian nuclear agreement and so on. Trump has come along and has forged a coalition with them uh, um, to counter Iran. So they are pleased by that. I think we're pleased by that. Um, Obama had difficulties also with, um, you know, Egypt. Um, and that's another key ally, by the way, in this, in this fight. Somehow or other, regardless of how bad the Egyptian government is or how militarist it is, we need Egypt as an ally just like we need Turkey as an ally. Uh, so, you know, they're going to have, but those are very complicated, especially the Turkish relationship, very complicated relationship. Uh, but I think Trump would like to see a, you know, coalition of Arab Gulf states containing Iran or pushing back on Iran, um, an effort to try to deal now with the post-conflict situation in both Syria and Iraq with the help of Turkey. Uh, with the help of the, um, you know, moderate Arab forces, um, try to, you know, work with Egypt to, to maintain the peace with Israel and, and on Israel's borders. And Israel's really under the gun on, in many of these cases, certainly from the rockets now that the Hezbollah and other groups have been collecting, uh, supplied by Iran, by the way, uh, to eventually launch another war against Israel. Um, I, I, you know, I like the fact that Trump is both willing to stand up to Russia and cooperate with Russia. Um, I think that's where our relationship is to some extent. Stand up to him on Ukraine. Don't compromise on Ukraine or compromise, but I mean don't abandon Ukraine. Don't do what some people advocate. Um, um, uh, some of the, of the realists in our debate who say treat Ukraine as a buffer state. It should neither be east nor west. It's sort of in between, make it a neutral state. Well, we had that argument about Germany back in the 1950s. It doesn't work. It just creates a vacuum, and that makes the competition even um, more dangerous. So um, um, I think that um, you don't compromise with Russia and Ukraine, but you maybe compromise and work with Russia and Syria. We had this agreement with the Russians about uh, a ceasefire in south, the southeastern part of Syria a couple of months ago. Yeah, it's worked okay. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't not do that kind of thing simply because I don't dare you know, cooperate with Russia, otherwise they'll accuse me of collusion. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think he's pretty, you know, he's pretty solid about, um, or pretty sophisticated about that. I don't think you're going to get a lot of help out of Russia, but to the extent that we can, we're not, you know, the whole objective is to 
is to is to dress our interest in terrorism without putting in large American forces. That's the key um, requirement, it seems to me, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, yes, sir. I was going to ask, is there another lady who's I did miss? Ah, let me ask the lady, and then I'll come back to you, sir. Yeah. Good question. No, it's a good question. And, you know, I mean, in some sense, we went from a, an administration that depended heavily on diplomacy and didn't want to show any military muscle to an administration now that seems to have downgraded uh, diplomacy and maybe hasn't really used a lot of military force. I mean, other than this bo bunker buster bomb that we dropped. And I think that was Trump's way of just saying, look, a new sheriff has arrived in town. Uh, watch out for us. But look, the subtitle of my book, Conservative Internationalism, which Professor Kaufman uh, uh, mentioned, is Armed Diplomacy under Jefferson, Polk, Truman, and Reagan. And so there are chapters in the book on those four presidents. What do I mean by armed diplomacy? Well, it's interesting. I, I mean that you almost always, if you use diplomacy, you must always back it up with force. Otherwise, it will not have any effect. Because if you're not willing to stop the gains that the other side is making on the ground with force. They have no interest in negotiations. Oh, they'll negotiate, but only until they win the conflict on the ground. Uh, on the other hand, you never use force without having an off-ramp, a diplomatic off-ramp that you offer to all right, the other side. The idea is to gain some leverage, military leverage, that you then use in negotiations. Now. Uh, you know, what's a good example of that? Well, I think one of the best examples is how Reagan uh, addressed the arms control negotiations with the Soviet Union. Uh, prior to that point, we had been trying to negotiate these arrangements, these arms control arrangements with the Soviets, uh, while not competing with the Soviet Union on the ground. All right, we were cutting defense budgets in the 1970s and so on, post-Vietnam. And the Russians were spending a lot on defense. And so they were putting all kinds of new missiles in the field, including these intermediate range nuclear missiles in Eastern Europe. Now, Reagan came in and he said, you know what? They're not going to be interested in negotiations to reduce those intermediate range nuclear missiles until we deploy our own, until we push back. That's kind of use of force in the context of thinking about negotiations. So he led the NATO effort to deploy those missiles. We did that in November of 1983. The Russians immediately walked out of the arms control negotiations. You know, everybody who opposed this policy said, aha, aha, we told you so. What happened is a year later, as soon as Reagan was reelected, they came right back to the negotiations. And of course, they then negotiated the complete elimination of those weapons. Because now the Russians realized we don't have the advantage anymore we, we, on the ground. Our advantage on the ground has been nullified by their deployment of those weapons. So, hey, now we can go ahead and make a deal. Um, so so you, you need to, but the whole purpose of that deployment, and Reagan said this in the campaign in 1980. He says, I favor this deployment pending negotiations. In other words, he was thinking about a diplomatic off-ramp. Now that was, you know, I mean, he was really thinking long-term, and that was one of his real advantages um, because it spent, took him three years. And by the way, over the um, opposition, you know, of massive street protests and everything else in Europe. Go back and read about the protests against the nuclear the deployment of those INF weapons by NATO in 1982 and 83. Um, it was a close call, um, but Reagan stuck with that policy, got his arm to diplomacy, but then immediately went into negotiations, or as soon as the Russians were ready, went into negotiations. So that's what I mean by leverage diplomacy or arm diplomacy. There was a great debate between Kerry and Obama, on this very point in the case of Syria, this is told to us by, the, by Joseph Goldberg, Jeffrey Goldberg, in his interview with Obama uh, in uh, April of 2016. Kerry went repeatedly to Obama and said, you know what, we're getting nowhere in the negotiations with the Russians and Assad and other countries that were involved uh, in Geneva on Syria, that is on the what's going to happen to the Syrian government, how we're going to manage this problem in Syria. He says, you know, we need to use some force. 
on the ground in Syria, to let them know that we're in the game, to get them to take us seriously at the negotiations in Geneva. Uh, and he pleaded over and over again. Finally, you know, uh, Obama told him, said, look, that's the last time. I don't want to hear this again. Now, Obama's view was that any time, and this is the other argument, and it's a logical argument, his view was that if you're going to use you know, force like that at any time in negotiations, you're only going to make your negotiations tougher because you're going to increase distrust. And isn't the purpose of negotiation to increase trust, not distrust? So he said to Kerry, you know, look, I'm trying to get them to see that there's a way that we can resolve this. If I try now to use force, I'm just going to exacerbate things. Uh, maybe even start down a slippery slope where they will then use more force, and before you know it, we're using more force, and bingo. Now, that's a legitimate argument. It just is, there's a counter-argument, and the counter-argument is Kerry's argument. Look, Mr. President, just use a little bit of force. Let them know we're there, um, and then deploy it immediately in some kind of step towards an agreement in the negotiations. So it's a very important point, which which a lot of... I know my students, certainly, and even journalists don't understand. That is, that diplomacy can never work without force, and force can never succeed without diplomacy. I mean, the most you can do with force is to, you know, destroy your enemy. Now, what are you going to do where he used to be? That was the problem we faced after we destroyed Saddam Hussein. Now, what do we do? Oh, dear, we need diplomacy. So there have been some presidents. Polk was my favorite. You, you, some people don't even know Polk was a president of the United States. But uh, he was terrific in managing the Mexican War. Of course, he's also vilified for that war. But if you take a look at his diplomacy and how he used leverage diplomacy, he was terrific. Yes, sir, you've been patient. What's your read on the environmental position of the Of the administration? Yes. And you're thinking in particular of the Paris yeah. uh, Climate Accord? Um, I think it's not very important to Trump, and, 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 and there's a case to be made for that, that is, of all the problems that he's facing, you know. Obama really elevated it, and some of us wondered if he really understood what he was doing, because he once said it was the only existential problem we face. Well, I'm thinking, you know, by next month, things could blow up in North Korea. It's pretty existential, isn't it? It's a lot closer than climate change. So, you know, you can have differences of opinion about you know, um, even the quality, ultimately, that is the sophistication of some of the models and so on, which we're basing this. But more importantly, you can have reasonable disagreements about how much money should we spend on it compared to all the other things that we have to do. Now, in Trump's case, I don't think it's going to, he's going to spend a lot of money on it. But, you know, meanwhile, a lot of forces are working on that problem, and maybe the really important forces, like market forces, um, and that is what's ultimately going to resolve the coal problem and the fossil fuel problem. It's going to be markets. And, and they're moving. They're moving, maybe not as fast as some would like and, uh, and uh, faster than others would like. Um, but I think, uh, you know, he's clearly open. He wants to deregulate fracking in America. Well, that's one way to cope with, um, you know, uh, our dependence on uh, uh, Middle East oil, and, and, and I think some of the environmental consequences of, uh, in, in the Middle East are, are, are more serious than the consequences of, of fracking. I don't want to minimize them, but, um, um, and, and, you know, he wants to obviously uh, ease some of the regulations on pipelines and so on. So he wants to make us an exporter of LNG, um, which is a clean, you know, fuel. So it's one of these issues where, while I would agree with Trump that it's not, wouldn't be high in terms of what to invest in at this stage, I'm glad there are lots of groups that are competing on that issue because that's the way market groups and then the ones who want to restrain uh, or want to regulate the, the outcome because that's the way we, you know, we, we, we have historically dealt with these problems and we'll deal with this one. All right, I'm here to give you the two-minute warning. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, made, I, I included them in my thinking when I said tribal, but I should have said tribal and sectarian, um, although sometimes those two overlap, as we know in the case of uh, Saddam Hussein and his connection with his Sunni Tikrit um, tribe. Um, look, I mean, and, and that's an important, a very important aspect of the whole problem in the Middle East. Uh, I personally believe, but um, I suspect there aren't many good, you know, Muslims who believe it, that the answer to that is economic development. Um, um, that is, you create the possibility that everybody can prosper in a growing economy and worship as they please. You get away from the idea that this is all there is and we either, you know, we either fight for our faith or there's nothing else to fight for. But that's going to take an awful long time. I mean, in the meantime, you're going to have to just patch together a lot of, un, you know, piecemeal and unstable arrangements. Now, what could happen in some of these Sunni areas, you know, the Anwar province uh, in, um, in now, all right, now that we're thinking about how to repopulate those areas and under whose control. Here's where I think an American presence in, Israel, in, in, in Iraq is very important, and we should have kept that presence there, uh, uh, you know, in, in 2011 when Obama withdrew us completely, because we can at least keep the, keep the pressure on the Iraqi government to try to manage, which is largely now Shia, uh, to manage the relationship with the Sunnis and with the Kurds. I mean, we have a, you know, I don't know, maybe a 20, 30 percent chance of holding that in check over the next three, four, five years. If it breaks out, what do we do? Uh, you know, I don't know whether Trump may already instinctively have put us on the right track. We may say we don't like the battle, but we're not taking sides. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'd rather almost do that than um, what happens if the Kurds and the, and the Iraqi government get into, con you know, get into a shooting war. I mean, I, you know, the Kurds are very good friends, but I hope we've been pretty honest with them to tell them that, look, we're not going to go back and overthrow the government in Baghdad again, uh, if it comes to that, so, so let's not let it go to that. In other words, go and negotiate, take the best deal you can get, go back and fight again tomorrow, I mean, at the negotiating table, um, and, and, and see what you can do. Oh, good. <laughs> There is a school of thought, Michael Waslin, and I'm sympathetic to it, that the Chinese actually see North Korea as serving their purpose right. of driving the United States out of the Pacific, leaving a vacuum right. which the Chinese will fill. What if that is the Chinese right. operating code, and what can we do about that? Well, if that is the Chinese objective, um, they're not going to achieve it by letting North Korea create a war, right? War, let alone a nuclear war. So I don't deny, I mean, you're absolutely right, I agree uh, that um, China gains a lot of benefit from the behavior of North Korea in terms of their desire to roll back the liberal Western order in Asia, as I mentioned, and expand their own, their own reach uh, in, in that part of the world. Uh, and um, uh, but I don't think that they have any, are under any illusion that somehow or other they can achieve that by letting the North Koreans start a nuclear war or start a war. So I'm hoping that there's a small, narrow range of sort of um, options there that you can discuss with the Chinese. Uh, how, do you, how do you put this thing now? And I think Trump has, to some extent, gotten their attention in this regard. I mean, they seem to have put, it's always hard to to, to know whether what's actually happening, but it looks as though they've actually put more stronger uh, uh, sanctions now on their own firms and their own banks operating with North Korea. Um, they're not going to let the North Korean uh, regime collapse, all right? And they're not going to let you immediately replace Kim Jong-un, which would be very destabilizing throughout that region. So they're going to want, you know, what I'm, what I'm urging is that we think about 
a longer term two, three, four, five year plan for what kind of moderation in the behavior of North Korea could we both accept, recognizing that China gets a lot of benefit out of some of the, you know, um, deviant behavior of North Korea. It's one reason, too, why Trump's not going to make any progress on this and one reason why other presidents didn't make any progress uh, without breaking some eggs. And he's more willing, certainly, than Obama was, maybe even than George W. Bush was, to break some eggs. So he's creating that impression, at least. And, and I've been quite surprised by the extent to which he's, uh, um, you know, brought Xi around. Now, all this may be, by the way, it may change. It may change in the next month because she is now, you know, she's having a big party conference, which is in, in Beijing, which is establishing his rule for another five years. And he's been planning for that for a long time, and he's been maneuvering internally um, in, in many ways. So with that out of the way, is he going to go back to, uh, you know, a rather in, intransigent, uh, you know, uncooperative stance with respect to uh, a joint, you know, a, a cooperation with the United States vis-a-vis -vis North Korea? I don't know. Um, but I do think there are limits to the behavior that China wants to see North Korea engage in, even to serve its objective of expanding its influence in the region. Thanks very much. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, there is a reception up here. I won't vote for it. But it mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Well, Listen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you.